when I came into this classroom, we had 30 desks, 30 chairs, a teacher's desk. That was it. Public school teachers spent $1.6 billion of their own money on classroom supplies. I was a history teacher at a high school in the Bronx for five years, and it just occurred to me that there were people out there who'd want to help teachers like us if they could see exactly where their money was going. Donors Choose is the greatest, simplest idea. Teachers go to the website and put up materials they need for something they want to teach. You, as a donor, choose a school, choose a project. And you can fund part of a project or the entire project. It is magic. Well, with Donors Choose, you know exactly where it goes. Every dime goes exactly to that project. And you hear directly back from those kids and from that teacher. Um, I use it for a lot of English and reading. But people also do field trips or a special project that maybe they need a piece of technology for. We're moving into the age of technology and the only way my kids really get those experiences are really at school. To have someone out there give them books, the feeling that they get, they feel like somebody in the city cares, somebody in this country cares about me and, and my future and my potential and that's, that's a powerful thing. Thanks so much for, for choosing this session. I'm really excited to be here and to uh, share our story with you. I give you a preview already, so I'm gonna jump straight in and ask each of you a question. Raise your hand if you had a teacher in high school who you look back on as having really shaped who you are. Who had a teacher like that in high school? Okay, awesome. Virtually, every, I think almost everybody here. Um, I had a teacher like that as well. Here he is. His name was Mr. Buxton. He was my English teacher and my wrestling coach. And when I showed up as a dorky freshman in high school, Mr. Buxton uh, spoke to me like he would to any adult. If he approved or disapproved of something I'd done, I knew it right away because he didn't have that mask that some grown-ups have when they're talking to kids. If I asked him a question on Wednesday, he'd come back to me on Friday saying that he'd thought about it. And he really had. He made you feel like he wanted you on his team. And looking back on it, I think it was Mr. Buxton who made me want to be a teacher. So uh, 18 years ago, I started teaching history at Wings Academy, a public high school in the Bronx. But the school where I was teaching did not have the same resources as when I was in Mr. Buxton's classroom. Where I went to high school, we went on field trips into the woods. We had graphing calculators for trigonometry, the supplies to do just about any art project we did not want for anything. But when I started teaching in the Bronx, I saw firsthand that all schools are not created equal. My colleagues and I would spend a lot of our own money on copy paper and pencils, and then we would talk in the teacher's lunchroom about books that we wanted our students to read, and a field trip we wanted to take them on, and a pair of microscopes that we needed for a science experiment, and none of these ideas would go beyond the teacher's lunchroom because there was no, no place for us to go to tell the world about the needs of our students and our ideas for making the subject matter fun. And we, we had no place to get the kind of micro-funding we needed uh, for these ideas we were coming up with. And it just occurred to me that there might be people out in the world who'd want to help teachers like us and students like ours if they could see exactly where their money was going. So I used pencil and paper, I wasn't a, a techie, so I, I used pencil and paper and I drew out this website where public school teachers could create classroom project requests and donors could choose a project that they wanted to support. Uh, for $2,000, a programmer who had uh, recently arrived from Poland here in New York was willing to build uh, that site, turn my pencil and paper drawings into software. And what he built for 2,000 bucks was uh, super rudimentary, the back end of the site was one page that you'd have to scroll down and down and down and down and down for like 15 minutes to get to the teacher or the project record that you were looking for. To process a donation, I had one of those uh, black boxes that you see at the grocery store where if they can't um, swipe your credit card, they type in the credit card number and the dollar amount, send it over a telephone line. So, so it was like PayPal, but by hand. And um, it's a really good thing my students were helping me to to get the site off the ground. Then I had to get my colleagues to try out this new website and create the first projects, give, give the site a go. Now I don't know how it is at 
your own workplaces. But at the high school where I was teaching in the Bronx, if you wanted teachers to do something, you gave them free food. And what you see right there is um, these roasted pears that my mom used to make. She, she would do these pears with orange rind and apricot jam and spices and roast these pears in the oven and the, the juices would come out and it would all like swirl together. And let me tell you, they tasted something awesome. My mom made 11 of these pears and I brought them into the teacher's lunchroom. And as my colleagues prepared to pounce, I said, hold up, there's a toll. If you eat one of these pears, you gotta go to this new website called donorschoose.org and ask for whatever it is you most want for your students. Sounded like a pretty good deal. Took my colleagues uh, like two minutes to scarf the 11 pears and then they proceeded to post the first project requests. The health teacher, uh, she ate the dessert first and she wanted to do a pregnancy prevention project for which she needed baby think it over dolls, which are life size, life weight dolls that cry at three in the morning and need to be fed and show a teenager what their responsibilities would be were they to have a kid. The English teacher, he wanted to get uh, his students ready for the SAT, for the college entrance exam, and so he requested test prep books. The art teacher, she wanted to do a wall-to-wall -wall quilt with each of her students sewing a square, so she requested fabric and thread and needles. The other uh, history teacher and I, we wanted our students to meet Maktar Tayeb. He had been profiled in the New Yorker after escaping from modern day slavery in Mauritania and West Africa. Uh, he'd been given asylum and uh, was in the United States uh, giving speeches to people telling them that slavery still exists in some forms. Well, our students had just finished reading the autobiography of Frederick Douglass. And we thought how incredible it would be if our students could meet someone who himself had escaped from slavery. So our uh, project was to bring Mokhtar Tayeb in. We, we had our students read the profile of him in The New Yorker, and, and our project was to bring in Mokhtar Tayeb and enable our students to, to meet him. So those were four of the first 11 projects up on the site, prompted by my mom's 11 pairs. And um, my aunt, who's a nurse, she funded the first project. But I didn't know any more donors to fund the other 10 projects. So I funded them myself, which I could afford to do because I was still living at home with my parents and um, uh, they were not charging me any rent. So I could spare some of my teacher's salary to fund my colleagues' 10 projects. And because I donated anonymously, my colleagues mistakenly thought that the website actually worked. <laughs> and that there were all these donors on the site just like waiting to fulfill teachers' classroom dreams. That rumor uh, spread across the Bronx and <laughs> Teachers started posting hundreds and hundreds of projects, projects that needed a whole lot more money than what I could afford by living at home with my parents. And is in a really tough spot, not knowing how I was gonna get these projects funded. My students came to the rescue. Uh, they could see the potential of this experiment to change their lives at school. And uh, I think they also felt bad for me. So, um, they, they, they volunteered after school every day for about three months to spread word to potential donors. They addressed and compiled 2,000 letters by hand to people all over the country telling them about this website where someone with $10 could be a classroom hero. We sorted the mail ourselves to get the cheapest postal rate and so every desk in my classroom represented a different part of the country piled high with envelopes. And then we carted the sorted letters to the post office and crossed our fingers. It worked. My students' letter writing campaign generated $30,000 in donations to classroom projects on our site. We were off. Another year went by. More teachers in the Bronx created projects. Donors funded some of them. And then 9-11 happened. And teachers at the schools beside Ground Zero started creating projects on our site to recover from the attacks on the World Trade Center. As a math teacher whose students' calculators were sealed at the disaster site, their classroom had been relocated to a basement and she was requesting a new set of calculators. There was a uh, high school art teacher who wanted her students uh, to be able to participate in an after school workshop with an artist who had immigrated from Afghanistan so they could meet someone from that country, learn about its history. There was uh, a first grade teacher whose students, uh, she, she was right by ground zero and, and her students had been saved by a particular group of firemen and her first graders wanted to thank the firemen who had saved them by doing a musical performance in front of their fire ladder company for which they needed musical instruments. So there were hundreds of these projects 
uh, focused on 9-11, and I thought that uh, local media would jump on this story. This was right when people yearned to participate in the 9-11 recovery effort. Red Cross had almost too many blood donations than they could put to good use, and here was this really direct, vivid way to participate in the relief effort. But no reporter would give me the time of day. I think I must have called, must have called like 100 of them with no luck. So I figured I'd better aim higher. Holy Grail was the New York Times. They had a new reporter covering nonprofits and philanthropy. Her name was Stephanie Strom. And I figured if we could get Ms. Strom at the New York Times to do a story about our experiment of a website, we'd have a shot at big time impact. So I put together a package of materials. I mailed them off to Ms. Strom at the Times. I didn't hear back. Um, so I called her up a few weeks later. And she was nice, but she said that um, she said that we were not, not exactly newsworthy. She said, uh, you know, if ever I'm, I'm doing a, a listing of online charities, which at the time was still a new concept, uh, maybe I could put you on that list, but I'm afraid, afraid this is kind of small potatoes. Damn. So then I found a directory of the top people at Newsweek, and I called the senior editor there, Jonathan Alter. I called him first because his last name began with A, so he showed up first in the alphabetical directory. And I called him during my lunch hour, and his assistant must have been out to lunch because he picked up the phone. And I said, hey, I'm a teacher up in the Bronx. I started this nonprofit with my students. Do you want to hear about it? And he said, sure. He didn't hang up on me. We talked for my whole lunch period. And that night, he wrote a column for the Newsweek website saying that this experiment growing out of a Bronx classroom might one day change philanthropy. So then I called up Ms. Strom at the New York Times, all excited, and I was like, hey, Newsweek saw us as newsworthy, at least for their website, so won't you give us a second look? And then she dashed my hopes. She said, I wouldn't touch your story with a 10-foot pole now that another reporter has covered you. New York Times does not follow in the footsteps of other publications. Oh, I felt like an idiot for having told her that another media outlet had broken our story. So I, I wrote her an email. Uh, apologizing for being so dumb. And uh, Ms. Strom took pity. She could see how badly I felt. And, and she wrote back and she said, you know, you shouldn't feel quite so bad because you didn't have a chance in the first place. Because her editors had asked her to focus on charities responding to 9-11. So there was my last opening. I crafted this email to Ms. Strom telling her about all the projects that teachers at the public schools beside Ground Zero were creating on our site to, to, to recover from the attacks. I called her up as well. I called her over the weekend, so I would go straight to voicemail, and I wouldn't interrupt her while she was on deadline. And I said, this is the last time you'll ever hear from me if you could just read this one final email. So Monday, I was back at school teaching, and uh, I checked my email in between periods. Ms. Strom had written back. She wanted to come do an interview for a major feature story in the New York Times. Let me tell you, my parents raised me to be humble, but it felt like the skies had opened. This is the New York Times. I just had to shout. So I forwarded Ms. Strom's email to my friend, and I said, guess who said she wouldn't touch our story with a 10-foot pole and now wants an interview? That's what hustling will get you. I beat my chest. I talked all kinds of smack. I thought... Thought that I'd hit forward, but, but I'd hit reply. And the moment I realized, I yanked the electrical cord from out of the socket to turn off the computer. But it was too late. I sent that trash talking, guess who said she wouldn't touch our story with a 10 foot pole and now wants an interview email directly to Ms. Strom, philanthropy reporter for the New York Times. So naturally, I sent her another email apologizing for being so dumb. <laughs> and Ms. Strom, uh, to her eternal credit and mercy, uh, took pity on me. Uh, she went on to write a, a feature story for the New York Times, um, say, arguing, suggesting that DonorsChoose.org might be the future of philanthropy. And since that time, we, we've been trying uh, to earn Ms. Strom's uh, mercy, try, trying to, to prove her right. Um, 
as of today, the, these numbers actually uh, need to be updated because we've now crossed the half billion dollar mark in terms of the dollars given to uh, classroom projects on our site. It's more than 70% of all the public schools in America who've got at least one teacher who's created a project request on our site. And there are millions and millions of students from low-income families who've now got books, art supplies, field trips, butterfly cocoons, uh, 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 class visitors, the, the kinds of materials and experiences that really bring learning to life. My students and I never uh, dreamed that uh, we'd be able to cite figures like this, and we certainly never dreamed that crowdfunding would become uh, a movement. When DonorsChoose.org began, crowdfunding was years and years away from, from being a word, but uh, today there are hundreds of websites where People on the front lines can identify a need they see, propose a project they want to do, secure a micro loan for a small venture they want to start. And then anyone, no matter the size of their wallet, can be a, a patron, a financier, uh, a philanthropist. A, a wager that uh, within the next five to 10 years, uh, at least a couple percentage points of our GDP will be from crowdfunded projects and ventures. I think, I think the movement will continue to grow. So that's our story. And I want to um, now explain uh, exactly how we've made crowdfunding work in public schools in the United States. So when a teacher creates a project request on our site, we first make sure it's legit. And we email follow-up questions to the teacher if anything is unclear about the student learning that will result if the project is funded. The school year alone, we will probably get uh, somewhere between 250,000 and 300,000 classroom project requests, each of which has to be carefully vetted and reviewed. We used to pay people to do that work, but then we realized that we could turn to our, our best teacher users to volunteer to vet other teachers' project requests. So now if you're a teacher and you've had 20 or more projects funded through our site, you've proven yourself to be an amazing educator, super responsible, responsive user of our site, we invite you uh, to give your time to become one of our, our colleagues and to screen and vet other teachers' project requests. It's kind of like academic peer review meets Wikipedia. And now that we have crowdsourced this labor to our best teacher users, instead of paying people to do it, the average time it takes us to vet and post a teacher's project has gone from 10 days when we are paying people to do it to just about a day and a half, even inclusive of weekends. That's, that's the power of, of pushing intelligence out to the edge, of seeing your so-called beneficiaries as your coworkers, which I think is, is at the heart of, of the promise of crowdfunding. So now a teacher's project is up on our site. Uh, right now at this moment, there are 53,000 classroom project requests live on donorschoose.org. That's a lot to choose from. So when a donor comes to our site, we encourage them to express a personal passion and, and look at the projects which match that narrow passion. Example of this is a few years ago, uh, a writer for Fortune magazine was doing a story on Kiva and donorschoose.org as the two websites that they thought might, might democratize philanthropy. And uh, when I was done talking with the writer, uh, um, he seemed decently impressed by our site, but he said that his personal passion was saving the salmon in the Pacific Northwest, which was kind of a nice way for him to say that um, education wasn't his top cause and he probably wouldn't be donating on our website, much as, much as he enjoyed the interview. But before he left, I, I did a keyword search for salmon on our site, and up came five classroom projects focused on salmon in the Northwest. The, the second result was uh, a teacher at a high school in Oregon who had created a salmon hatchery in the river flowing by his school, and he needed hip waders uh, for his students to be able to maintain and build out the, the salmon hatchery. Top result was a project from a teacher on an island off Alaska, teaching in a one-room schoolhouse. She wrote in her uh, project essay that she was 45 minutes away from the nearest store by airplane. And all of her students are native Alaskans, and they had recorded their parents uh, folk tales about salmon, done research on salmon, wanted to share that work with the outside world for which they needed a printer and a scanner. So here was this guy who had a passion for salmon and five projects to choose from. And as a result, there's a group of kids in, uh, at an Oregon high school who now have the, the hip waders they need to help maintain and build out their teacher's salmon hatchery. 
Last part of the donors choose.org process is the, the best part. Uh, when, a, when a project is funded, we don't pass through cash to the teacher. Instead, we purchase the resources and have them delivered to the classroom. So even if the project is a therapeutic horseback riding for disabled students, we pay the horseback riding stable to provide that service. And then every teacher for every project publishes photographs of the project in action, a uh, thank you note, an impact letter describing what students are learning. That, that feedback goes to all donors, even if they're giving just $1. And donors who give $50 or more also get uh, student thank you letters. Our donors get to, to see and feel the impact that they've had. Throughout this process, we try to be totally transparent. I'll give you one example. Once in a long time, the classroom isn't able to provide those student thank you letters. Usually it's an understandable reason, like the teacher's gone on maternity leave or switched schools or uh, uh, something as understandable has happened. But internally, we call this a jilted donor situation. It happens about 1.5% of the time. And when this happens, we contact the donor and acknowledge that we've fallen short, even though they, they probably never realized that they were due student thank you letters in the first place. And we offer to fund another project of their choice on our dime. Now that might sound like a kind of a, a fall on your sword and uh, expensive thing to do, but um, most of our donors are, are, are blown away by, by the apology note that we weren't able to send the, the thank you letters. Few of them take us up on our offer of funding another project of their choice on our dime, but our apology note does often prompt them to make a whole new donation. We once looked at the, uh, the data and concluded that one of our biggest revenue drivers was screwing up and admitting it, which I think is, is a, a, a lesson that, that uh, hopefully applies to all sorts of sectors and, and organizations. So that's our story. That's how we operate under the hood. Uh, I promise to share uh, some of the data that we've been mining and some of the insights that we've been able to derive from our data because I think it shows how um, micro philanthropy or, or education crowdfunding plays out in the everyday lives of consumers. So um, I showed you uh, kind of the, the, the scale of the goodness happening through our website and for a couple years now we've had a data science team uh, to, to plumb the data generated by all that goodness. I want to start by showing you uh, what we've learned about kind of the, the psychology of generosity. Uh, first, we found that um, women tend to donate to classroom projects on our site throughout the school year, unprompted by any particular day or occasion, whereas men tend to donate to classroom projects on, on holidays or, or special days. Our only uh, uh, explanation theory here is that, uh, is that altruism comes naturally to women, whereas men need to be prompted by some kind of external stimulus to, to be philanthropic. Uh, this data is actually statistically significant, so I'm not going to ask Leos or Cancers uh, to raise your hands because your cohort uh, makes fewer donations on our site and uh, smaller donations as well as less frequent donations. Aries and Taurus uh, give less but make uh, larger than average donations, and Capricorns give, give both more frequently uh, and more generously when they give on our site. For this, we have no explanation, but it actually is statistically significant. Um, this is the final, uh, uh, the third um, sort of consumer giving uh, uh, test or, or set of data I want to share with you. So um, two years ago, we have an open office, and, and I overheard our CFO telling a colleague about a book he had just read by this guy, Adam Alter, who's a, a business school professor uh, at NYU. And um, Adam Alter had been citing research that people are more likely to donate to hurricane relief if the first letter of the hurricane is the same first letter as their own name. And, he, and this effect was apparently so pronounced that they were able to calculate that the US Meteorological Survey has left half a billion dollars of hurricane relief giving on the table by not optimizing the names of hurricanes to have common first letters if they're going to be especially severe and hurricane relief giving will be especially necessary. So it's just like overhearing uh, this study and, and got up and, and my colleagues and I started talking because we we're like, what does that mean for us? We've got two and a half million supporters. We've got half million teachers. We could match them up based on not just first letter, but even a name match. What could we do with that? 
And we decided to run a test on Valentine's Day. We came up with three poems, and we randomly assigned donors to get one of these three poems. The first poem said, roses are red, violets are blue. We heart this teacher and hope you do too. And underneath that, that poem that we emailed to, to a third of our donors, we displayed a classroom project request that was algorithmically uh, selected to be compelling, uh, close, close to the finish line, um, not, not far from its expiration date, not needing too much money uh, from an especially uh, uh, high need public school that uh, donors had already partially funded, all, all sorts of signal that this is a compelling project and we would display a specific one of those projects underneath this poem. But we also sent a second poem to another set of donors, which said, roses are red, violets are blue, give to a teacher's classroom near you. And here, we would key off of the donor's IP address or their billing zip code and display a classroom project request close to the donor. So that should win, right? Because that's hyper-local, geo-targeting, holy grail of personalization. Surely, this one, this one dominated. But maybe not, because there was a third poem that we sent. And the third poem to another set of donors said, roses are red, violets are blue, give to a teacher with the same name as you. And then we would display a classroom project request that might be for a topic you don't care about, 10 states away from you, but from a teacher who shares your last name. And if you have one of the 10 most common last names, we would instead key off of your first name. Because if your last name is Smith, and we find, a teacher, or we find a project from a teacher whose last name is also Smith, you're like, you know, tell me something new. It's a common first name, it's a common last name. So um, we would make sure that we were keying off of something that was at least a little bit idiosyncratic about you and finding a teacher who, who shared that idiosyncrasy. All right, any guesses as to uh, which of the poems uh, did best, which, which inspired more donations? This is rhetorical. You're already guessing, right, this, this poem <laughs> behind me. Um, Indeed, it was this poem, and it wasn't just that this poem won, it was that it crushed hyperlocal geotargeting, which in turn had crushed just a, 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 a general compelling project. Um, so that, that was really interesting to us because, again, hyperlocal targeting is supposed to be the, the apex of, of customization and personalization, but in fact, uh, you, can, you can be even more effective when you uh, find kind of an idiosyncratic commonality between a donor and a teacher. Um, we're even more excited about uh, birthday matching because you know, like you, you meet someone at a party who shares your name, you're like, oh, it's kind of cool. You meet someone who shares your birthday and you're like, we are kindred spirits. Like, this is amazing. So uh, we'll see what, what uh, the, the sort of um, uh, generosity effect is of a matched birthday. While we're up in this data uh, about consumers, I want to show you just a super quick hit, a couple things about our teachers, because this could actually impact education policy. We looked at um, all of the book requests on DonorsChoose.org and concluded that if you have a, a nephew or a niece or a son or a daughter uh, who's between the ages of 8 and 12, make sure they have Diary of a Wimpy Kid, because public school teachers clearly think this is an especially effective book at getting kids hooked on reading. Uh, we did a, a, a wonkier analysis, which I'll show here, which is of the effect of the recession on low-income versus upper-income classrooms. And what we found was that in low-income classrooms, the recession led to a major increase in the proportion of requests for essential items like copy paper, pencils, dictionaries, as compared to enrichment requests for a field trip to Washington, D.C. to see the Supreme Court consider a case, or a really cool art project that needs certain art supplies. Whereas in upper income classrooms, the recession led to no such increase in the proportion of requests for essential versus enrichment materials. There's a, there's a bunch of numbers on this slide, but the short of it is that we were able to show that the recession ha had a terribly uh, disparate, regressive impact on public schools, leaving kids in low income communities without bare essentials, whereas kids in upper income communities whose schools were probably still struggling, nevertheless did have the fundamental materials available in their classrooms. The final uh, uh, data point I'm gonna show you uh, to illustrate the, the kind of uh, policy potential of this data is um, a timeline showing that months before any city or state official in Flint, Michigan had flagged the water crisis, 
there was a teacher on our site at a Flint, Michigan public school whose project was requesting bottled water because she didn't trust the water coming out of the faucet. So we think that the, the data that, that we've opened up is not only a way to um, explore what makes people generous uh, and, and what uh, is the, the best way to establish a, a purpose connection with a consumer, but it is also data that could one day influence billions of dollars of government education spending, help, help uh, the government to be more responsive uh, and smarter and more efficient in their allocation of taxpayer dollars to, to the resources that we put in our classrooms. We think we can, in a way, give voice to classroom teachers and enable uh, the powers that be to hear what classroom teachers are trying to tell us about what books are best at getting kids hooked on reading, what technology devices are most needed, what topics are trending in teachers' minds. All right, uh, I, the last thing I promised to do was just to give you a couple super quick hit uh, case studies of how um, donorsjuice.org can, can foster generosity and purpose in the workplace. Uh, one of those examples is J. Crew uh, here in New York City, which creates a leaderboard every year so that employees can team up and then give to classroom project requests that they're passionate about as a particular team of employees. And then those teams can compete against each other uh, within J.Crew to see who can be the most generous. And uh, it's an opportunity not just for uh, team, uh, for, for kind of uh, intramural competition within the company, uh, but it's at the very same time a way for an employee to express themselves because maybe they're searching for salmon and finding uh, a salmon project. The other uh, example I'll give you is of Pinterest. Um, they did a distribution of donors choose gift cards to their employees. Uh, a donors choose gift card is what Stephen Colbert gives to every guest of his on The Late Show. It's a, it's a gift of giving that enables the recipient uh, to support a classroom project of their choice without having to open up their own wallet. So Pinterest gave DonorsChoose.org gift cards to uh, all of their employees and encouraged their employees to support a classroom project uh, within the city of San Francisco. And what employees didn't know was that Pinterest had underwritten enough DonorsChoose.org gift cards for Pinterest employees to complete the funding on every single San Francisco elementary school project on the site. And because all of Pinterest employees uh, uh, or, or nearly all took this action, Pinterest as, as a collective was able to bring every elementary school San Francisco project to life. And I think that this was very different from a, a corporate foundation um, uh, in, a, in an office doing something awesome. This was a mobilization of every employee at Pinterest uh, to, to engage in microphilanthropy, to find a project that spoke to them personally, but to feel that they were having a collective impact. All right, that's the story of how we began, including the most embarrassing thing I've done, how we operate under the hood, what our data can tell us about generosity and purpose in everyday consumer life, what it could tell us uh, in the world of education policy and budget making, and how it plays out in the workplace. So I will now just leave you with um, a, a crass solicitation that each of you give $1 to a classroom project on our site. And I would ask each of you to, to express a personal passion. It could be the town where you grew up, the sport you played in high school, the hobby that you're pursuing right now, gardening, yoga, knitting, uh, the, your favorite author, the book that you read uh, to a kid uh, within the last month. Express a personal passion. Find a project that, that matches uh, you and your background. And then when you're uh, going through checkout on this $1 donation, tell the teacher and students why you chose their project. We encourage every donor to, to leave a message to the classroom because we think that DonorsChoose.org is not just a place where um, donations are transacted, but where relationships are forged. And, and as you're doing this, I hope you'll appreciate what you and a passionate teacher can accomplish together when no one stands between you. Thank you for your time. That's our story.